Okay, welcome to my presentation. Um, Yannick already gave a very nice introduction on how important and useful three core block ciphers are. Uh, let me nevertheless give you a brief introduction as well. Um, however, I will do it a little bit uh, quicker then. Um, so a normal block cipher is just essentially a, a permutation. So for every secret key, it's a permutation, which means that if you encrypt the same message, you get the same ciphertext every time. And to add some flexibility, people used tweaks. And a tweak randomizes the scheme in some way. It's a public parameter such that every tweak uh, gives an independent looking uh, permutation. And the relevance of it already became clear in this, this picture, in this scheme of SCT. Um, to give you another example, um, let me discuss this. Well, I, I called it OCBX. Um, I, I learned that I should have called it Theta CB. Yeah. So this is essentially the generic design of OCB1, OCB2, and OCB3. And I think it's one of the, the pioneering designs in using three core block ciphers for such applications. And I think it also shows how, why three core block ciphers are interesting and important uh, for security analysis. So what we see here, so again, authenticated encryption scheme. Uh, A is associated data, M is the message, you get a ciphertext and a tag. Um, but we use a three core block cipher everywhere where the tweak is, it consists of a nonce and some a position identifier. So the nonce is a unique value for every encryption. And the position identifier uniquely determines at which position the three core block cipher appears. And because it is a three core block cipher, every new evaluation of this three core block cipher is done under a different tweak. You get independent looking three core block ciphers everywhere, and you can easily prove uh, security of the scheme. Um, note that by changing the tweak, you're essentially changing the function. So there is a side condition here, namely that you want that changing the tweak should be very efficient. So it should be very efficient to go move from one tweak to another one. Um, so the question is how to design three core block ciphers. Um, Yannick showed already that there are various approaches to do it from scratch. Uh, the most recent one is this tweaky framework, which kind of blends the, the key and the tweak. In this work, I focus on generic design, where we use an existing primitive, like a block cipher, and build a three core block cipher on top of this. Um, so in the first formalization of three core block ciphers by Liskov et al., they also introduced two three core block ciphers based on a normal block cipher. Um, th th those are these two actually. Um, the most interesting one for us is now the, the right one. So what we see is that it has a normal block cipher, which is masked by some universal hash function on the left and on the right. Um, and it's similar to what, what was uh, proposed by Rogaway two years later. Rogaway improved the scheme uh, specifically for the usage in OCB2. And the idea of the new scheme is that the masking it's not based on a universal hash function, but you use the same block cipher. Um, and the tweak consists of, of a nonce, of course, and alpha, beta, and gamma. And alpha, beta, and gamma are used to represent the position in the OCB scheme. Uh, so the, the mask is then computed in this case as 2 to the power alpha times 3 to the power beta tr times 7 to the power gamma times the encryption of the nonce. So it was introduced for OCB2, but there are many Caesar submissions that adopted this idea. Um, so this is block cipher based approach, but it appear, appears like there is a current trend towards permutation based designs. This was already apparent in the, the Caesar comp in the SHA-3 competition with, with Kachak, the, the permutation based hash function. Um, also in the, the Caesar competition, there are quite some permutation based designs. And it is possible to transform this to a permutation based setting. As a matter of fact, in 2014, the MinAlpha team introduced the tweakable Evan Monster construction and it is similar. It uses a public permutation. Yes, it uses a public permutation, and the masking is done in the form like two to the power alpha times three to the power beta times seven to the power gamma times the key XOR with a permutation permuted version of the key. Um, and it got so Twiqual F Monster got generalized a lot by Coliati uh, at all last year. And it's clear that there is a relation between this scheme and the, the, and the XEX scheme of the previous slide, because if we take, for instance, XEX with nonce uh, zero, and we take the normal Evan Monster constru construction, this one, and we plug it into XEX, we get this construction that very much looks like XPX. So there is a relation among the, between these two schemes. Um, so I already mentioned that in the Caesar competition, there are quite some uh, tweak core block cipher based designs. And as a matter of fact, we can group these directions in three approaches. So we have this dedicated three core block cipher design, 
uh, we have XEX inspired designs and Tweakable F Monster inspired designs. And if you check the list of initial CSR submissions, there were 57 submissions, um, 18 of them were based either explicitly or implicitly on Tweakable block ciphers. Um, actually, I have to, the, the, the one that only uh, participated in the first round, I put it in, bla in plain text. Bolt is the second round. I didn't manage to update it to the, the new result from this evening, uh, last night. But it turns out that six of these schemes ma uh, went to the third round. So six of the third round candidates are Tweakable block cipher based. Um, in this work, we consider permutation based design. So we effectively generalize this Tweakable Evan Mansour approach. In more detail, we consider XPX. And XPX is a public permutation in the middle, masked by, on the left, T11 times K, XOR T12 times PK, and on the right, T21 times K, XOR T22 times PK. So the idea is that the tweak is of the form T11, T12, T21, and T21, which comes from a certain pre-described tweak set at T. And this tweak set is, um, depends on the use case of the tweakable block cipher. Um, so for now, the tweak set can still be any set. However, it turns out that the security of XPX strongly depends on the choice of the tweak set. Um, at a high level, we will show, we will essentially make a separation. So we synthetically analyze all possible tweak sets, and we make a separation between um, weak tweak sets for which XPX is completely insecure, um, normal tweak sets for which you get single key security, and normal tweak sets are essentially the ones that are not weak. And if you put slightly more conditions on the tweak set, it turns out that you can get related key security. And surprisingly, there is no much efficiency difference between these two, uh, among these three cases. So it's very easy to, uh, to get related key security for a scheme if you have normal uh, single key security. I will come back to this later. Um, so what now remains to do is to essentially formalize what we mean by weak, normal, and strong. And let me start with, with weak tweak sets by giving an example. So here we have, well, it's XBX again. Suppose now that the tweak 0, 0, 0, 0 is allowed. So the tweak set, the set of allowed tweaks, contains tweak 0, 0, 0, 0. Um, I think it, well, it's trivial to see what happens if you use this tweak set, this tweak 0, 0, 0, 0, for any message m. The output of the XBX is just P of m. It's independent of the key. And you can break it uh, trivially. So this tweak should not be allowed. Uh, there are different tweaks, like 1011. If this tweak is allowed, the attacker can use this tweak for message 0. Then we see that the input to the permutation equals k. The output equals p of k, which cancels out with p of k from the mask, and the output is k. So if this tweak is allowed, you have a key recovery attack. Uh, there are more advanced cases, like 1002. There are also cases where we have couples of tweaks that should not be allowed at the same time because then you can break the scheme. Um, so there are some silly cases in a certain way, and it makes sense to limit the tweak set to exclude these cases. And this brings me to the first uh, definition, which is the definition of valid tweak sets. And it's a technical, technical definition. I will not go into detail, um, but it's a technical definition, but it's easy to verify whether or not a tweak set is valid or not. And we actually proved that it's a minimal definition. We show that if a tweak set is not valid, if you have an invalid tweak set, then XPX is completely insecure. So it's really a minimal definition of validity. Um, and these are effectively the weak uh, tweak sets. We will show the opposite too. Instead, in fact, we will show also that if, tweak, if the tweak set is valid, then you have security, then XPX is secure. Um, and this is done in the, the normal, uh, well, strong tweak or pseudo random permutation security model. So the attacker is given access to either the construction query, either to the construction XPX, or a random equivalent, tilde pi. Um, and the attacker is also given access to the underlying primitive P, which is assumed to be an ideal permutation. And the complexity of the attacker is counted by the number of queries. So it can make Q construction queries and R primitive queries. And then we prove that if the tweak set is valid, then we get birthday bound security of this construction, um, where Q is the number of construction queries and R is the number of primitive queries. Um, so this is just, well, it's plain single key security. 
but we also consider related key security. And in related key security, the attacker has more power. What the attacker can do is it can query the construction, um, not only for the tweak and the message, but for every query to the construction, the attacker chooses a function phi, and it learns the construction evaluation on input of, uh, for key phi of k. So it can choose for every query a function to transform the key. And this gives the attacker extra strength. Um, it makes sense to restrict the, the set of key deriving functions in some way, otherwise you can trivially break it. Um, and there is a well-known function. It's a function that consists of the set of XOR uh, differences. This was already considered a long time ago in the formalization of related key uh, security by Ballara and Kono. And so what we, we defined by phi XOR and consists of all functions that map K to K XOR delta, where the attacker can choose uh, delta for every new evaluation. Um, and this has some relation to, a, to a silly implementations where, um, where a key is, for instance, refreshed by adding a counter. In this case, you would facilitate attackers with such uh, sets of key deriving functions. Uh, we also look at a slightly stronger set, which we call phi p XOR, which consists of the set of all functions that map k to k XOR delta or the set of functions that, well, abusing notation, map p of k to p of k x or epsilon. So the attacker can always choose delta or epsilon. The second set looks a bit contrived, but let me recall that the masking in XPX is of the form ti1 k x or ti2 p k. So in this respect, it makes sense to look at these two sets of key deriving functions. And now for these sets, we, we define and uh, we uh, prove the following results. So first we show that, so. So first, for normal PRP security, where the attacker can only make forward queries, we show that if the tweak is valid, so if it satisfies this condition, it doesn't contain silly tweaks, and T12 is always non-zero, so in the use case, T12 is never zero, then we get the XOR-related key security. Um, if you also condition that T22 is always non-zero and you have this tactical side condition, then you get even strong related key security for XOR differences where the attacker can make inverse queries. Uh, for the more involved set, we have similar results. So for instance, for the last one, we have that if the tweak set is valid, and T11, T12, T21, and T22 are always non-zero, then you get strong related key security for this strong set of key deriving functions. So I will not go into detail in the proof. Um, instead, I would like to give you some examples of how this result can be used, um, what it means, and how it can be used for certain applications. And let me start with a very simple example, which is the normal Evan Mansour scheme. So on the left, we see XPX. On the right, we see this normal, this well-known Evan Mansour scheme. And Evan Mansour is covered by XPX by taking as tweak set just a singleton, just the tweak value 1010. Zero, one zero. I mean, if the tweak set consists of one tuple, the user always has to take this as the tweak, which effectively means that it's just a normal block cipher. Um, the tweak set is valid, which means that this result, uh, which means that our result shows that Evan Monster is a secure block cipher. Um, well, this should not sound as a surprise to you because this has been proven many times already, um, but it's just to show that well, what it means. And in general, XPX for any possible, so if you take any tweak set of size one, XPX is a normal block cipher. So as a side result, it essentially covers a wide range of even Evan Mansourish uh, block ciphers. Um, XPX also covers this XEX with Evan Mansour. So if you take XEX uh, with Evan Mansour installed into it, it's covered by XPX by a more involved set of, uh, a more involved tweak set. Um, so what we do essentially is we, we take alpha, beta, gamma, uh, just any possible x, e, x tweak, and we define t11, t12, t21, and t22 on top of this. So the dijs are functions of alpha, beta, and gamma, and that's the way we can define xpx to cover x, e, x with Evan Munster. And this set is valid, and as a matter of fact, it also satisfies that the, the values are always non-zero. Um, because in x, e, x, 2 to the alpha, 3 to the beta, 7 to the gamma is never 1. Um, it's never 0, of course. So the, um, where is it? this one is never 0, of course. x, e, x has the condition that two, this 
uh, 2 to the alpha 3 to the bad 7 to the gamma is never 1. So you always never have a 0 here. So you have a very strong related key security for this very strong set of key deriving functions. And to show you how this can be used, let me um, go to, to the COPA authenticated encryption scheme. Um, so COPA is, is designed by Andreva et al, 2014. It has well, associated data, the message. Um, using some magic, you get a ciphertext and the tag. For now, it's not important to look at how the scheme works. What's important is that um, COPA is implicitly based on XEX, in which internally AES is used. So COPA is, based on, is XEX based on AES. Um, and there is a variant of this that's pros COPA. And it, pros COPA differs from COPA in that it doesn't use AES, but instead it uses evan mansour construction. So pros COPA is COPA based on AES, XEX based on evan mansour based on A permutation. And it makes sense to, to question what, to what uh, extent can we use the existing security results of COPA to guarantee security of pros COPA. So to what extent do the results carry over from one scheme to another one? And for single key security, that's quite a straightforward question. It's in fact almost a trivial question. Uh, and to see this, let me look at how the COPA security proof works. So what's done for COPA is essentially as follows. The first step is a reduction to XEX. So one reduces the security of COPA to the security of XEX up to the birthday bound. That's the, the existing proof. Rockaway analyzed XEX, and Rockaway proved that XEX, based on the block cipher E, is birthday bound secure. So you reduce the security of the XEX to the security of block cipher E. And then you plug in XE, AES, and you hope that AES is secure. That's how the COPA proof works. Now for Preuss COPA, you don't stop at the block cipher E, but we have an additional step. We have an F monster construction based on a permutation. Uh, so we make one more step, namely that F monster is secure up to the birthday bound. And that's for single key security. So this is nothing surprising. Now for related key security, it turns out that for COPA you can do the same trick. So if you dive into the proof of COPA, you see that you can do the same trick for related key security. So the related key security of COPA reduces to the related key security of XEX up to the birthday bound, reduces to the related key security of E up to the birthday bound. And then you assume that AES is related key secure. But what if we go for Preuss-Copa? For preuss -Copa, we need to make an additional step. And this step is the related key security of Evan Mansour. And Evan Mansour is not related key secure. You can break the related key security of Evan Mansour in two queries. Um, so this approach does not work for preuss -Copa. It doesn't mean that preuss -Copa is insecure. It just means that this, this naive, this straightforward reduction doesn't work. And now we can use XPX. Because XPX is essentially XEX, covers XEX with Evan Mansour, so we, make, we, we just skip the step through E. We make a direct step, and we get related key security. Um, similar idea can, for instance, be used to MinAlpha, which uses this uh, tweakable Evan Mansour. And so MinAlpha was defined to use tweakable Evan Mansour, but you can also see it as based on XPX with quite a simple tweak set. And using similar techniques, you get related key uh, security. Um, a final example, which is, I think is interesting, is the Chasky design. So it's not an authenticated encryption scheme, but it's a MAC function. And so we have, the, of course, a secret key. We have the message. And then we do some magic with the key. And then you get the, the tag. Um, so we have two pictures. The, the top one is for integral data. The bottom one is for fractional data. And the, the, the scheme is, is uh, introduced by Mua et al. in 2014, and the proof went as follows. So the proof essentially reduces the security of Chasky to the security of a uh, three Evan Mansour construction. So it's not clear from the picture, but somewhere in this picture there are three Evan Mansour constructions hidden. And the proof reduces the security of Chasky to the security of these three constructions. Um, but if you, really, if you now look back at this proof, this is equivalent to XPX with a tweak set of three tuples. Namely 1, 0, 1, 0, uh, 3, 0, 2, 0, and 5, 0, 4, 0. Because the attacker can choose every time which Evan Mansour construction to query, which is essentially equivalent to saying that the attacker can choose a tweak every time. Um, this tweak set is valid, which means that we get single key security of the XPX construction and we get birthday bound security. So we've redone the security proof of Chatsky. 
Um, the tweak set is valid, but no more than that. You cannot get related key security. And actually, you can break related key security of Chatsky, right? If you have XR related key difference, you can undo it with M1. You need to do some tricks here too, but that doesn't harm the, the, the attack. But now if we adjust Chasky, so I left some blank space here. I did this on purpose because now I'm going to plug in a permutation here. And this is, so what we do is we permute the state. We, we first XR the key, then we permute the state. And effectively, this adjusted Chasky is based on XPX with a tweak set T prime by consisting of these three tuples. And if you do redo the exercise now, this tweak set is valid. It gives related key security, and you get related key security of, of Chasky. And you see, that the change is not expensive. You just have to pre-compute P of K once. Um, and you get related key security. That's a simple fix of, 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 of uh, achieving stronger security. Um, and similar techniques could be applied to key sponges and key duplexes, because Chasky can be seen as a member of these uh, schemes. It, uh, it can also be applied to various sponge-based CSR candidates. I said 10 candidates. These are the initial candidates. I think there are still three uh, left in the third round to which it could be applied. Uh, so to conclude, we introduced XPX. It can be seen as a generalization of tweakable Evan Mansur, and not a generalization the way Coliati et al. did it with a number of rounds, but instead looking at a single round and checking what level of security can we get. And we, we achieve various levels of security, ranging from insecurity to single key security to related key security. Um, we show that the result has various applications. Many CSR candidates, many initial CSR candidates uh, could be covered by XPX, and also various hash functions, MAC functions. Uh, for further questions, it would be interesting to see what happens if we go for multiple rounds. Then you can get beyond birthday bound security, um, which could be of interest if you have small permutations. If you use the scheme with a big 1024-bit permutation, it makes no sense to look at beyond birthday bound security. But if you have small permutations, it makes sense. And another question would be to look at other settings where related key security um, is important, and probably also um, this would also give different sets of key deriving functions. So that concludes my presentation. I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.